matching methods. This module is about a quasi-experimental evaluation method called matching. So far, we have discussed a number of experimental and non-experimental approaches to estimating the impact of a program. When evaluating a program impact, we must always ask, what is the best method to evaluate this program? The suitability of a method for measuring the effect of a treatment depends on the validity of its underlying assumptions. Which evaluation method should you choose? Looking at your data, you can ask yourself which of the assumptions built into each of the methods are the most plausible. The random selection method, or RCT, requires that assignment to treatment and control groups is random. The instrumental variables method, or IV, requires a valid instrument. It requires a variable that is correlated with the treatment, meaning it is a major determinant of the probability of benefiting from the program, and which is also exogenous. Exogeneity is the strongest condition because it implies that the instrument does not affect the outcome except by influencing the probability of receiving treatment. The difference in differences method, also called DD, requires panel data. Namely, we need data from before and after the intervention. The underlying assumption in the diff in diff method is that the treatment and comparison groups both experience similar events or influences over time. This is referred to as the common trend condition. This assumption is not testable because we cannot observe what would have been the trend of the treatment group had they not benefited from the intervention. The diff and diff method is useful when the selection into the treatment group is based on unobservable characteristics, i.e. when there is unobserved selection bias. Obviously, such a procedure of assignment to treatment is impossible to control directly because it depends on factors that we do not observe. There is unobserved selection when a program is assigned to those who are most in need, generally speaking, there isn't any specific measurement of need, or when the program participants are the most motivated, or when the treatment is given to those who will benefit the most. These are all vague conditions, potentially determined by unobserved factors. When assignment to treatment depends on observable characteristics, which can be measured fairly accurately and which are available in my database, we can use matching methods, or the regression discontinuity RD method. In the next two modules, we will discuss estimators based on the first approach, matching. The main underlying assumption of matching estimators is selection for treatment according to observable characteristics. In the literature, this is called the conditional independence assumption. This refers to the independence of a potential outcomes and assignment to treatment T after having controlled for the observable variables that determine this assignment. Selection for treatment based on observable characteristics means that within specific subgroups in this evaluation sample, selection for treatment is as good as random. In using the matching method, we assume that among subjects with similar observable characteristics, the fact of receiving treatment or not depends purely on chance, i.e. is completely random. For example, if I split my evaluation sample according to age, civil status, fertility and gender, matching assumes all individuals within the groups created by these characteristics have the same probability of receiving the treatment. All young, single-parent females are assumed to be similar. Among their similarities, they all have the same likelihood of benefiting from the program. The subgroup of young females with children and a partner should also have the same probability of receiving the treatment. While their probability may differ from the previous group, within each group the random assignment is only based on chance. Selection on observables implies that there is no unobservable selection within each subgroup created by the matching variables. There is no selection bias given the observable characteristics X. This is the assumption of conditional independence. Outline this module begins with a review of unobserved counterfactuals. This should be a reminder of how important they are. Then I will talk about the intuition behind the matching approach. I'll start by presenting the simplest possible example, 
then discuss the basic principles of matching estimators. At the end of this module, you should understand which conditions are required for matching estimators to be valid. The condition of selection on observables that I just mentioned, as well as the identification assumption, which is a more technical condition and is easier to verify. I will not demonstrate these conditions mathematically. These results have been established in the literature with solid theoretical support. I trust these theoretical results. What is important in this module is to understand their empirical consequences. What do these assumptions mean and how can we interpret them? As an introduction to the matching literature, I will present the Lalande versus the Hidra and Waba debate. This is an academic dispute that occurred about 30 years ago, but which can teach us a lot about the choice of non-experimental estimators and the validity of its results. Towards the end of the module, I will present the limits of the matching approach, including the so-called curse of dimensionality. This is the impossibility of applying matching methods on many dimensions at the same time, and is the main reason why matching estimators are not very popular. In practice, few researchers use matching as their core estimation method. Most of the time, matching estimators are used as part of robustness checks to support a more popular estimation method called propensity score matching, or PSM. PSM is the subject of our next module. We are interested in estimating the expected effect of a binary treatment on a continuous outcome. For example, a treatment could be participation in a training program, with the outcome being income or wages. Each unit has two potential outcomes. Yt denotes the outcome of a unit that is exposed to the treatment, and Yc is the outcome when it does not benefit from the treatment. If both outcomes were observed, which is not possible, the effect of the treatment on a particular subject would be directly measurable by yt minus yc. We could then use this information across the entire sample. We could estimate the treatment effect for each unit 1, 2, up to unit n. The treatment effect for each unit is the difference between the two potential outcomes. The expected effect for a unit randomly drawn from the sample would simply be approximated by the empirical average of all effects. The idea behind the matching method is to estimate the potential unobserved outcome for each treated subject in the sample. The difference between matching and RCTs, random selection, is that RCTs estimate an average counterfactual for the treatment group as a whole. In matching, the counterfactual estimate is done one individual at a time. Assuming that unit I, with observed characteristics Xi, does not receive the treatment, we observe Yic. We wish to estimate its counterfactual Yit. This is an estimate of the value of outcome Y if unit I had benefited from the treatment. The idea behind matching estimators is to take units that are similar to i, that have observable characteristics x, which are similar to i, and use them to estimate the unobserved counterfactual. We need units who are similar in terms of x, but who are treated, to be able to estimate this counterfactual. Assume, for example, that units 1 and n are similar to unit i in terms of characteristics x but 1 and n were chosen to receive the treatment. This difference in the treatment status has to be due to chance, because otherwise the three units are identical. I will use the observed outcome among treated units to approximate the unobserved treatment of I, had I actually received the treatment. I can approximate this counterfactual, for example, by using the average of both untreated outcomes. Now I can estimate the treatment effect for i as the difference between potential outcomes yic that is observed and its counterfactual yit that I approximate. The validity of this approach rests on the assumption that assignment to the treatment for units with similar values of x is random. In other words, that units 1, i and n 
all have similar X's and that their probability of being treated depends entirely on chance. Matching estimators exclude the possibility that I has specific unobservable characteristics which makes them less likely to receive the treatment. This conditional independence assumption underlying the matching approach means that I is identical among individuals with similar X's. The X variables used for matching are called pre-treatment variables. Unlike the name suggests, X does not necessarily reflect values before the intervention. X consists of variables that are not influenced by the treatment. For example, age cannot change as a result of the treatment. Male, female gender also generally does not change as a result of treatment. Education can be used as a matching variable if it is not influenced by the treatment that we are evaluating. Of course, any variable measured before the treatment is also a pretreatment variable. Example. I have created an artificial database to illustrate the principle underlying the matching method. There are 10 individuals, I, and for each of them I observe the characteristic X, which is not affected by the treatment. X is then my pairing or matching variable. I observe whether or not the individuals are treated, whether t equals 0 or t equals 1, as well as their outcome, a continuous variable y. The image shows a graphic representation of the sample. There are two groups, the comparison group on the top and the treatment group in orange, represented below. Their observable characteristics x are ordered on the horizontal axis and their outcomes appear on the vertical axis. Individual 1, for whom x is equal to 2, is treated. I estimate the counterfactual using outcomes in the comparison group from individuals with similar x's. Individual 5, who was not treated, also has x equals 2. I use 5's outcome, 8, implying that 8 would have been the outcome of individual 1 had he or she been treated. We observe the treatment outcome for certain subjects and we approximate their counterfactual by using the comparison group. Individual 2 has x equals 4. Individuals 8 and 9 also have x equals 4, but are not treated. This raises the question, what do we do when there are multiple observations with the same value of x? The way we match individuals and the way we approximate the counterfactuals give rise to different matching results. In this case, I will take the average of the outcomes. 9 plus 6 divided by 2 is 7.5. I do not have an exact match for individual 3, who has x equals 5. The choice of whether or not to match individuals who do not have exact counterfactuals is important. Here, I will choose to match individual 3, but only because there are other individuals in the comparison group with similar x's. My matching is not exact but I have a property called common support for individual 3. This means that I observe other individuals with a similar range of x in the comparison group. Individual 10, for instance, has x equals 6. This is a little bit higher than 5, but still quite close. Furthermore, individuals 8 and 9 have x equals 4, which is also close. My estimate of the counterfactual for 3 will be the average of outcomes among those with the most similar x's in the comparison group. This matching estimator approach is called nearest neighbour matching. The use of the nearest neighbours is an ad hoc approach. The way of weighting or grouping individuals to construct a counterfactual gives rise to different matching estimators. Another question arises from this example. Can I use the same observation multiple times to estimate several counterfactuals? We have already used individuals 8 and 9 to construct the counterfactual of individual 2. I would like to use them a second time to construct the counterfactual for individual 3. The question is, should we implement matching with or without replacement? The short answer is with replacement, as in this example. The long answer is that researchers did matching without replacement for quite some time, but in 2002, 
Abadi and Inland wrote a working paper where they showed that matching with replacement leads to a smaller bias and better statistical properties. With replacement, each observation can be used more than once to approximate a counterfactual. According to the empirical evidence, matching with replacement produces better estimates than those without replacement. Matching with replacement enables us to pair more observations in the sample. Under matching without replacement, we risk ending up with treated observations with no match. Let's return to my example. The remaining untreated outcomes among individuals in the comparison group do not need to be estimated. I directly observed their untreated outcomes because these individuals did not benefit from the intervention. I can simply use their observed outcome. The same holds for the treatment outcome among individuals in the treatment group. I use their observed Y. I also estimated the treatment outcome for the comparison group because this is their unobserved counterfactual. The procedure is identical. I look for the nearest neighbours in terms of X and I approximate a counterfactual for each individual. Allow me to comment on individuals 7 and 10 who are outside the region of common support. In the range between 2 and 5 in terms of X, I have observations in both the treatment and control groups. For all these observations, I can say that I have common support. For individual for whom X is 1, not only is there not an exact match, but this individual is outside the region of common support. The same holds for individual 10 for whom X equals 6. The approximation of their counterfactual is considered to be of lower quality. When using more elaborate matching estimators, such as the propensity scoring method, we exclude the observations which are outside the region of common support. However, this is an illustrative example. For now, just keep in mind that the question of common support will be important later for more advanced methods of matching. Once the counterfactual has been approximated for all of our observations, I can calculate the individual treatment effect. The nearest neighbour matching estimator, or NN, approximates the expected treatment effect and is simply the difference in averages between groups. In this case, it is 0.18, which you can check yourself. On data, I will make a do file to estimate the average treatment effect with the NN matching estimator, the nearest neighbour. Clear all. Always enter this at the beginning of your code file. You can download a database to practice these techniques from the website for this course. The file name is Simulated Data for Matching. The .dta extension indicates that this is a Stata file. I copy paste the use command to be able to run my code from the do file. Let's take a look at the data. Individuals i go from 1 to 10. We have a pretreatment variable x, output y, and the assignment, which is not random, t. There is also an alphanumeric variable, a string, which is called match. This variable identifies the individuals used to estimate the counterfactual, just as we saw in our example. For individual 6, we have used the outcomes of individuals 1 and 2 to calculate the counterfactual of the treatment, which is 7.5. Y hat T is the estimated or observed treatment outcome, depending on whether we are referring to the treatment or comparison group. And Y hat is the untreated outcome of each individual. I will name the difference between the two potential outcomes D. D is equal to the treatment outcome y hat t minus the untreated outcome y hat c. If I execute my file, I see the estimate of the individual effect appear in the database for each individual. We also want to estimate the average treatment effect. I take the average of this difference, summarize d. I have 10 observations and the average difference is 0.183. Now try the stata nearest neighbor command nn match. The arguments of this function are the outcome variable y and the treatment variable t. 
Stata recognises the difference between lowercase and capital letters, so you must write capital T. Then, the matching variable is lowercase x. In principle, it is possible to do the matching over many variables. x can be a vector of pretreatment characteristics. To use the Stata command, we do not need to calculate the potential outcomes manually. Stata does it for us automatically. I get the matching estimator. The average treatment effect is 0.183. The outcome reads S-A-T-E. This stands for sample average treatment effect. We also get an estimate of the standard error and a test which tells us whether the estimated effect of the program is statistically different from zero. The p-value is 80%. Two remarks. First, Stata calculates the standard error automatically. This is why I prefer to use the nnmatch command. It also performs a test of difference of means. Secondly, the nnmatch command is not automatically installed in Stata. You have to download it. This is easily done. All you have to do is type the command ssc install and the name of the command to install, which is nn match. For me, Stata indicates that the command is already on my computer. Stata commands have many options that you should explore on your own. Among others, there is a bias correction of the matching estimator. There is a theoretical result, which also comes from Abedi and Imbens, 2002, which says that matching estimators are biased when matching is not exact. Now, you should be able to understand what that means. In our example, we have non-exact matching. This bias is especially important when matching variables, the x's, are continuous and there are many of them. We only have a pretreatment variable x and correcting for this is not necessarily relevant. We can correct for this well-known bias by adding the bias options after the comma. The new result is 0.186 and not 0.183 as previously found. The two results are fairly similar, which suggests that our bias was small. Recall that this is an illustrative example. It only has 10 observations, so this result itself is not of direct interest. What you need to keep in mind is that Stata enables us to correct for the bias in non-exact matching. We can also calculate the average treatment effect only for the treated, which I call TOT in previous modules. I can calculate this myself by typing summarize D if T takes the value of 1. In other words, it only accounts for treated individuals. The estimate is minus 0.72. I can also estimate the treatment on the treated effect with the option TC and specifying which treatment effect is to be calculated by typing average treatment on the treated ATT. I get the same estimate plus the standard error and p-value from a t-test. The treatment effect for the subgroup of treated individuals as opposed to across the entire experimental sample, is often of interest. For example, consider that you are evaluating a program which aims to increase income among youth from disadvantaged neighbourhoods. You can use the income of similar individuals somewhere else to estimate their counterfactual. However, the potential outcome of this program on youth from the comparison group is not necessarily relevant we are more interested in focusing on the impact of the program on the treatment group. In this case, it would be more relevant to calculate the ATT or TOT as we named it. The estimators. To estimate the impact of a program using a matching estimator, we need individual outcomes represented here on the vertical axis. One or several matching variables, which are not affected by the intervention, in this example, the matching variable or pretreatment variable is represented on the horizontal axis. We also need to know who was treated and who was not. 
The treatment status is determined in this graphic by the colour of a unit. Those in orange are the treated units and those in grey are the untreated ones. This graph involves two dimensions, but to match the units, to find them a pair, I only use one dimension, the value of x on the horizontal axis. In this example, I'm interested in a particular unit. This unit is treated, as indicated by its orange colour, and has an x value just under 0 0.6, say 0 0.58. We discussed before the nearest neighbour matching estimator. In short, the nearest neighbour consists of using the outcome of the nearest unit in terms of x as a counterfactual. If there are several units with equal scores, we take the average of their outcome to estimate what would have been observed had the unit of interest not been treated. But why only use one neighbour? You could choose to use two, three, four or more neighbours. Multiple nearest neighbour matching is an estimator that enables the calculation of a counterfactual using several near neighbours. In practice, this estimate is very easy to calculate by adding an option to the nnmatch command that we saw previously. The principle of nearest neighbour is good, but it is also dangerous. It is possible that the nearest neighbour is not actually very near. Sometimes there are holes in the data, intervals of x where there are no nearby units. In my example, there are not many holes, but it could be the case in your data set. To avoid comparing units that are too different from one another, you can set a fixed distance to select the observations to be used for estimating the counterfactual. In this case, all untreated observations within a certain distance in terms of x will be used to calculate the counterfactual of the unit of interest. This approach avoids comparing excessively different units whose values of x are too far apart. This is known as a radius matching estimator. Radius as in a circle. Why isn't it called an interval estimator? Why radius? Because x can contain many dimensions or variables. When there are several matching variables, the distance becomes a ball in the topological sense. The radius matching estimator resolves the problem of comparing distant units. However, it does not use observations efficiently. Sometimes units bunch together and sometimes they're spread out. In my example, I see some concentrations of observations here and here. There might be regions where observations are much sparser, but the radius length will be the same for all. Moreover, the radius has the same arbitrary length in all dimensions of x. The block matching estimator or in a similar approach, the stratified matching estimator enables us to adjust the window of observations included, depending on the data itself. I will choose a small range, small blocks, when there is variability and observations are well distributed across the dimension. I will allow a larger window whenever I have fewer observations or when they are not evenly distributed. In general, this approach by blocks is not good at dealing with regions where there is no common support. In this module, I'm giving an overview of matching estimators. We have only seen part of the picture as I'm omitting the technical and mathematical details. For more in-depth knowledge on block or matching estimators in general, you can read the 2002 article by Becker and Ichino. Let's discuss these windows and radii. The idea is to account for observations that are within the window or radius in order to estimate a counterfactual. Observations outside of the window are not used. Beyond a certain point, all other observations are ignored because they are too distant. For example, the observations in the orange region, no matter how close they are to the frontier of my ball, they are not used. They are beyond the limit of my window. Kernel estimators solve this problem of the rather arbitrary choice of the cutoff point by weighting observations around the point of interest. Kernel estimators give greater weight to observations close to the unit of interest in terms of x and less weight to observations further away. The weight itself is determined by a distribution function. 
a Gaussian kernel weights the observations according to the normal distribution. This is called a Gaussian distribution. Near to my point of interest, I attribute more weight to the observation. This declines as we move further away. In this figure, I observe all points, but I will use only untreated individuals in the comparison group for my estimation of the counterfactual. These are coloured grey. The choice of the distribution is also arbitrary. I could have chosen an Epinechnikov distribution. In this case, my estimator would be called an Epinechnikov kernel. In practice, different kernel estimators often give very similar results. Your choice of distribution is not too important. What is important is the idea of weighting by the distance to each observation when estimating the unobserved counterfactual. The takeaway message here is that the matching approach requires some compromise between the quality and the quantity of matches. The different estimators address the problem differently, but none of them are theoretically better than the others. A common practice is to measure the effect of a treatment using several estimators as a means of defending the robustness of the result. Underlying assumptions. Matching uses the observed characteristics of participants and non-participants to approximate a counterfactual. This approach relies on the strong assumption of selection based on observables, often referred to as the conditional independent assumption. It implies that there are no unobserved differences correlated with potential outcomes once we have controlled for certain observable characteristics. Formally, the potential treated and untreated outcomes are orthogonal to the treatment status given the values of x. Matching estimators are only valid when the fact of receiving treatment or participating in the program can be considered as random among individuals with the same observable characteristics x. Random assignment in RCTs satisfies this assumption of matching and even satisfies the stronger assumption that the potential outcomes are independent of assignment without being conditional on X. Earlier, we spoke of an estimator of the treatment effect solely among the treated, called the treatment on the treated estimator, or the TOT. The validity of this estimator is based on less strict assumptions. This is one additional reason to be interested in the TOT. The assumption of the TOT estimator is called the unconfoundedness assumption by Invens in his 2005 paper. Rubin, who is one of the pioneering users of the matching method, calls it the ignorability assumption. Unconfoundedness refers to the independence between participation in the treatment T and the potential outcome in the absence of treatment YC. This is different from independence with respect to the two potential outcomes, which is required to estimate the average effect across the whole sample. If unconfoundedness is respected, we can be sure that there is no omitted variable bias once we have controlled for x. There are no longer any unobserved characteristics which determine the assignment. The identification assumption is not respected if the probability of participating in the program conditional on X is 1 or 100%. For example, the probability of receiving the treatment among individuals under the age of 20 could be 1, because they are automatically admitted into the program. For those under 20 years of age, there is a 100% probability of receiving the treatment. All subjects under the age of 20 are in the treatment group. As a result, there are no observations with this characteristic in the comparison group to be able to calculate my counterfactual. The identification condition requires the existence of comparable individuals in both groups to be able to estimate the treatment effect. If you have a variable that perfectly determines the treatment, you should estimate the impact of the program using a different method called regression discontinuity design, which we will address in a future module. To introduce you to the literature on matching, I will present an important academic discussion that took place at the end of the 1980s. It is important in that it led to deep reflection on the validity of quasi-experimental methods. In 1986, Robert Lalonde's doctoral thesis was published in the American Economic Review. 
In his article, he used experimental and non-experimental methods to measure the effect of a labour training programme on the income of beneficiaries. Potential beneficiaries were randomly assigned to treatment and control groups. Since this was an RCT, it was possible to directly estimate the effect of the programme by determining the difference in averages. Lalande's idea was to find other comparison groups to calculate non-experimental estimates of the treatment effect. He found that most econometric procedures do not reproduce the results of an RCT. This conclusion led to a major controversy among economists because accepting this result meant that quasi-experimental methods were not useful in practice. Lalande compared the standard ATE estimators, or average treatment effect, of the RCT with the estimations which would have been found by an econometrist when using quasi-experimental methods, such as diff and diff, a method that we have already covered. In 1999, De Hegia and Waber more or less ended the discussion in an article published in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. They used an estimator based on the matching principle to show that quasi-experimental methods are capable of reproducing or at least approaching the results obtained with an RCT. Their conclusion is that matching methods produce good estimates. The problem now is that following this result, some researchers use matching methods without verifying the validity of the assumptions. However, the Hedra and Huaba obtained valid matching estimates when the underlying assumptions were satisfied. Allow me to use this article as an opportunity to emphasize the question of reproducibility of results. The Hedra and Huaba made the data used in the estimations available to the public. This is great. You can download the data for free online. However, the code they use for their estimates is not available. Many researchers have tried to replicate their results, but since details on how the estimates were constructed are missing, it has proven difficult, apparently impossible, to precisely reproduce the results of the original article. The scientific community has been increasingly aware in recent years of the importance of the replicability of results. Academic journals increasingly require researchers to provide their data as well as the code used to obtain the published results. This is a matter of research ethics. As a researcher, you always have to be prepared to provide details about your estimates. Let's get back to the academic disagreement between De Hedra and Waba and Lalande's analysis. I would say that both positions are well-reasoned. Lalande wrote, researchers should be aware of the potential for specification errors in other non-experimental methods. De Hedra and Waba argue reasonably that the estimation of Lalande does not satisfy the assumptions needed for quasi-experimental methods to be valid. For matching in particular, the crucial assumption to obtain good estimates in the sense of being similar to those of an RCT is that the sample used to estimate the counterfactual should be similar to the treatment group. This is the matching identification assumption. Moreover, selection into treatment should be solely based on observable characteristics. The lesson that can be learned from this debate is that yes, the matching approach can work well. However, Lalande's point is often ignored despite awareness of it. There is a cost to not doing an RCT. To obtain valid matching estimates, the assumption about selection on observables should be satisfied and the comparison group used to calculate the counterfactual must be similar to the treatment group. I will now present some details about the program Lalande evaluated in his article. I do so because these are landmark papers that are often cited in the literature on matching and it is helpful to fully understand the context of the discussion. In the second half of the 1970s, the federal government of the United States implemented the National Supported Work Demonstration. This was a temporary employment program designed to help disadvantaged individuals lacking in basic skills needed to get a job and participate in the labour market. The program guaranteed employment to beneficiaries over a period of 9 to 18 months. It also provided personalised support by following up on the progress of participants. What enabled Lalande to compare experimental and quasi-experimental methods 
is that opposed to other employment and training programs, the beneficiaries were chosen to be in the treatment group using a random selection procedure. In total, between the treatment and control groups, more than 6,600 individuals and 10 cities across the United States were involved in the experiment. This group of potential beneficiaries included single mothers, school dropouts, former drug addicts and law offenders. In short, a socially vulnerable population. The program administrators collected individual level demographic data on both the treatment and control groups. They established the baseline situation of the pool of potential beneficiaries who were randomly assigned to the two groups. And then they collected data on the two subgroups every nine months. Some follow-up data was collected while the program was running and the rest was collected after the program ended. Naturally, it is more interesting to estimate the effect of the program after it's finished, because we want to know if participation changes the outcome afterwards. During the program, participants had lots of support to keep their job, and it would be natural to observe an effect. A more interesting question in terms of policy outcome is if beneficiaries have comparatively higher income once the program is over, and for how long the program effects continue. Among other issues, this program was expensive. The cost per participant was between seven and nine thousand US dollars. The goal of the evaluation was to estimate the outcome of beneficiaries if they had not participated in the program. With experimental data, this is easy. One only needs to take advantage of the average outcome of individuals in the control group as an estimate of the income beneficiaries would have had if they had not been involved in the program. Without experimental data, the researchers estimated the treatment effect by using the outcomes of a comparison group drawn from the population. In the quasi-experimental evaluation, we need to make econometric adjustments to account for the fact that the characteristics of participants and those in the comparison group are different. The matching method is a fairly versatile method which enables us to evaluate interventions from this non-experimental perspective. However, the ability to obtain valid estimators from matching has limitations in terms of the quantity of data required and its statistical properties. First, matching is data intensive. Matching requires a large and rich comparison group. You need many comparison units as well as information on their individual characteristics. Even if such a database exists, there is always the risk of not having common support or of the treatment and control groups not being comparable. Matching is best implemented with discrete variables and lots of data. In fact, it should not be done at all with a small comparison group. Secondly, matching should only be done using the observed characteristics. This involves assuming that there is no selection bias arising from unobserved characteristics. By definition, it is not possible to control for unobserved characteristics. So, to construct a comparison group using a matching procedure, we need to assume that the fact of being treated is independent of the potential outcome, once we condition on observable matching characteristics. The major shortcoming of matching is that it is not possible to prove the validity of this unconfoundedness assumption it is not possible to prove that no unobserved characteristics are influencing treatment status and outcomes. We must assume this. This is generally a strong assumption. Matching enables us to account for selection bias according to observable characteristics, but cannot exclude the possibility of bias due to unobserved characteristics. Also, the idea of estimating the unobserved counterfactual of the treatment group using observable characteristics the pre-treatment variables, is not without risk because we might accidentally implement a pairing based on characteristics that were affected by the program, which puts the validity of the estimate into question. To find a good match for each participant in the program, it is important to observe the variables or determinants of the outcome that are correlated with the treatment assignment. Unfortunately, this is not an easy task. If the list of relevant observed characteristics is very long, or if each characteristic has many variables, it may be difficult to find a unit in the comparison group that corresponds exactly to each unit in the treatment group. 
The larger the number of characteristics or dimensions accounted for, the greater risk of facing what is called in the literature the curse of dimensionality. For example, if you use four characteristics to find matches and to calculate the counterfactual, this is fairly straightforward. If you're looking for young female single parents, you will probably find a sufficiently corresponding observation for each participating individual. But you run the risk of not accounting for other potentially important characteristics which also affect participation in the program and the outcome at the same time. You could expand the list of matching variables, for example, by adding the number of children and the number of years of education. The database on the comparison group may not contain a sufficient number of observations to effectively implement pairing for each program participant. Fortunately, the dimensionality problem can be avoided by using a matching method called propensity score matching, which we will study in the next module. With this new approach, it will no longer be necessary to match each participant with a non-participant who presents exactly the same observed characteristics. It will be sufficient to estimate the probability of participating in the program based on certain observed characteristics. This probability, called the propensity score, is a number between 0 and 1, which summarises all observed characteristics that influence participation in the program in a single real number. Calculating the propensity score is extremely easy in practice. In this course, we will take the time to really understand the process, which requires the use of discrete choice models. Conclusions The estimates from a comparison group that is not experimental are valid, so long as the underlying assumptions of the method are satisfied. The matching method involves approximating the unobserved counterfactuals of every unit in the treatment group by comparing them to units that are similar in terms of certain observed characteristics but that are not affected by the program. The main assumption of this approach is that participation in the program is based on observed factors. In other words, selection to the program should be observable and must be accounted for. This assumption implies that there are no other characteristics that are unobserved and that affect both the outcome and also participation. This is the assumption of selection on observables, or the absence of selection on unobservables, which cannot be directly tested. The second assumption is that the statistical identification condition, which means that we need units with similar X characteristics in both the treatment and comparison groups, the identification condition implies that participation in the treatment should not be perfectly determined by the matching variables. The quality of results obtained by the matching method largely depends on the quality of variables used for matching, so it is critical to have a very rich database. Matching is generally less reliable than other evaluation methods. In particular, random selection methods do not rely on the unverifiable assumption of selection on observables. Furthermore, random assignment requires smaller evaluation samples and fewer observed characteristics than the matching method. <laughs>